Good afternoon. Good afternoon. The family would certainly like to express our deepest appreciation for your attendance today, number one, such an outpouring of love and care and concern, taking time to spend this moment with us. I also appreciate the journey that you had with us and with my dad over these many years. Look out in the crowd and I see a lot of memories and uh, you'd be humble, be proud. But whether you sit in a car or whether you stop by or gave us something on social media to help our family, it was heartfelt, it was thoughtful. And again, from the deepest part of our hearts, we appreciate your thoughtfulness and your kindness. We're going to selfishly make it a little bit about him today, but I know that probably would not be an accurate reflection if he could do it himself. In fact, I can say that without a doubt. Never was one to talk too much about himself. But as we gather today in tribute, we say goodbye to our body. The soul is gone. And we're here to honor and thank him for the impact he had on every one of our lives. Jerry Allen Waller, age 78, of Moulton, departed peacefully to his heavenly home, surrounded by his loving family at Mercy West Hospital in West Des Moines, in a beautiful afternoon, <clears throat> Tuesday afternoon, March 18. Jerry is survived by his wife, Marilyn, of nearly 59 years, three children, Timothy, wife Vanessa, Waller, Rebecca, husband, Jeff, Dalrymple, and Stephen, Teresa, Weller. Six grandsons, Thaddeus, wife, Danielle, Weller, Tayton, wife, Ashley, Weller, and Titus, Elizabeth, the wife of Titus, Elizabeth, Weller. Also, Zayden, Xavier and Zandon Weller. And one great grandson, Patrick Weller, <coughs> with two more to arrive on the way very soon. He leaves his sister, Norma Jean, husband Joe, boy, one brother, Rich, wife Lisa Weller, along with several nieces and nephews and great nieces and nephews. Jerry was preceded in death by his parents, Frank and Hallie Guest Weller. Jerry was born on July 10, 1942, in Anchorage, Alaska, to Jerry and Hallie Guest Weller. He graduated from Billings, Montana High School, senior high in 1960. He then attended Midwestern School of Evangelism in Ottumwa, Iowa, and graduated in 1964. He married Marilyn Berman on December 19, 1961, a lifetime companion, and a devoted mother, and a major support system. That's what it is without my mother. Jerry began his first four years of college by preaching to the church in Abington. He then moved to Knoxville, Iowa, where he continued his ministry for the next two years. Finally, Jerry moved to Bolton, Iowa, where he served and had served the Orleans Church of Christ for over 54 years. Preaching his last sermon just two weeks before his departure. He began teaching at Midwestern School of Evangelism around 1965. 
Jerry was also active for many years in the printing department while at Midwestern School of Evangelism. During these years, he wrote numerous Bible-related books and material. Jerry served as camp manager at Sharon Bluff Bible Camp for many years. He also managed Shomimo Camp in Missouri and Camp Cedar in Nebraska for several years. Over the course of his ministry, Jerry preached at numerous rallies, revival meetings throughout the country. Jerry enjoyed singing and especially loved Southern gospel music. He faithfully participated in sing inspirations and youth rallies. Jerry was noted for his ability to tell a Bible story and preach a sermon that would impact an audience of all ages. He always had time for others. Whether you were rich or poor, young or old, he was loved by all his community and participated in the community in numerous community events. Jerry had that special ability, Dan had that special ability to accept others no matter where they were at in their walk of life. It's often been said by others that their lives were positively influenced by having met Jerry. Though God was always first in Jerry's life, his love and concern for family, both close and extended, was heartfelt. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as we gather on this day to take time out to honor my father, and we reflect upon a life that many of us have seen, many have seen lived, as they've interacted with him and the focus and the goal he had upon doing what his mission was, was to follow your will, devote his life to being your servant. And as we look back upon that life and all of us and the memories we have and the interactions we have, we pray that we would take the lesson that what a difference a person can be if they let life allow them to have Christ as the focus in their life. That would be his message for us today. Forsake the world, seek Christ, keep him on focus, and let your life be used fully for his cause. Help us as we get through this day to be strong, help us to be able to look back on the good memories and determine in the days ahead if we really want to see him again. It's very possible. And reunite, reuniting is soon available to all of us. Again, I thank you so much for the life that's been lived and the blessings to each. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Jerry Willer has kept the faith. He has fought the fight. He has received his crown. The family has asked that the Gateway Singers lead you and you participate, if you wish, into a musical journey through much of his life and his ministry, the 60 years of his ministry. It's hard to believe that a, an erudite college professor as Jerry was loved children so much and spent so much time with them. If you were one of the thousands thousands of kids that went through the Orleans Church of Christ programs, you know what I'm talking about. And I don't know where he got the songs. It, it, he didn't plan it, I don't think. It just kind of came out. Let me get up front. Like this one. This one to come out. So you can join right in with us if you wish. I have the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. Down in my heart. I have the joy, 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 joy.
everybody to divide up the group with the um, hallelujahs on one side and the praise ye the Lord's on the other side. When it came time for you to sing your hallelujah, you would stand up. Then you'd sit down and that's too much work for us. But, but let's sing it together. Hallelujah, praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Scripture so very, 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 very much. And so the Bible and the blood were very important. Let's sing that one. time you just know how much he loved children his own children and their children and the grand more they're even getting more in their family just more and more and, and he loved your children he loved the folks in Bolton and Abington and all around he loved little children well just like he loved Jesus and Jesus did too one and only begotten Son. Whosoever believes in Him would never perish, but have everlasting life. And that's what Jerry believed in time. For God so loved the world Steve is the baby in the family. <laughs> and I'm just anxious to hear what Steve has to say. Age right, I am the baby. I'm uh, 15? <laughs> okay, all right, about 15. <laughs> well, here we are. Dad asks, Mom asks, and if Mom and Dad say, you do it, right? <laughs> so I'll put my 15-year-old uh, glasses on <clears throat> and uh, see how we do here. Glue tin cans, and most importantly, duct tape. If you didn't have those three things in your toolbox, now nah, you weren't going to fix anything. Glue fixed everything. Probably something that we broke playing ball inside that had been Tim's fault. <laughs> or maybe Becky, because she couldn't catch. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, tin cans. We had an old, I think it was a Malibu. And uh, the floors were, were rusted out. Just, you know, you could, you could see the highway going by. And, Dad was outside one day, he was fixing the car, and I'm like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm fixing it. How are you fixing it? <laughs> Got some extra coffee cans, now we have floorboards in, in the car. <laughs> <laughs> Had an old Rambler that he drove to school. Dropped the car off at the shop. I'll come back and get it after school. He goes back to the shop. 
I'm here to pick up my car. And they said, Jerry, we, we didn't fix it. What do you mean we didn't fix it? He says, well, that muffler, that's worth more than the whole car. We're not going to fix it. <laughs> I will tell you, we never had a Lamborghini, Corvette, you know, them fancy cars, but we went a lot of places. We were blessed with uh, a family giving us a, a car, and we had that car my whole entire school career. It took us a lot of places, a lot of places. Dad always had time for us, of course, as a family. Friday night was game night. We'd sit around the table, play games, and I don't remember when it started, but. Uh, it's probably had to be Tim's idea. I'm going to get Tim in trouble all day long. <laughs> but we decided one time that whoever lost would have to eat the most rotten piece of candy that we could find in the cupboard. <laughs> so that was the deal. At game night, the loser had to eat this candy. But I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I really like candy, but for some reason I like to save candy. I never would eat it. I saved it and saved it and saved it. So every once in a while, unbeknownst to me, Dad would clean out my drawer and take the candy to school and try to feed it to the kids at a good restaurant. <laughs> well, they'd open that piece of paper and there was nothing left. <laughs> so, you know, the, the candy deal was just, yeah, you, you did not want to lose. You know, he'd always have time to play ball with us outside. You know, he'd, he'd get home and as soon as he got inside, he'd, he'd come back out with his glove and, and ready to play. And I remember the one time, and I never could understand that when I was younger, but I understand it right today. He's out there playing, and he was having a little trouble filming. You know, I'm not a dad's pretty good ball player. But he, all of a sudden he says, I think that crown's just a little bit further away. <laughs> well, as you see, uh, I, I understand. We get it. <laughs> Of course, he attended whatever activities we were doing, ball games, whatever, he was always there. Um, cheered us on. He never, uh, there never was a ride home that he ever asked, you know, why can't you do this better? You know, what happened here? Never had that conversation. He just, he just enjoyed being there and, and being a support. Of course, Dad enjoyed eating. You all might know that, and of course, if anybody's <laughs> Tasting my mom's cooking. Woo! You, you enjoy eating too, right? Yeah, you would. Okay? But one thing about that, we had to have three meals a day no matter what. We had to have breakfast, dinner, and supper. Period. That's it. Well, when those meals were on the table, guess what? You were taking a little bit of everything that was cooked. Everything. Well, some of us <coughs> struggled with... Uh, or eating habits more than others. We had white plates. The next thing you know, it'd be a certain individual in the family taking those mashed potatoes and kind of smashing them down, kind of hoping that mashed potato would disappear in that white plate. You know, and nobody would notice. And, yeah, I cleaned my plate. I ate it. I ate it. But you can tell sometimes Dad didn't enjoy all, all that food. <laughs> nah, but he needed it anyway. Just, he, had, he had to be that example. We're going to eat. <laughs> and then, of course, <laughs> we didn't just have three meals. We had to have a snack. <laughs> so we'd have a snack before we went to bed. And I'd like for you guys to go home and try this today, and I still don't know how we did it. But he'd have a 16-ounce pop and split that in five cups. <laughs> you know, and I thought about that and thought about that and thought about that. I was like, how did he do that? <laughs> But all of us got, and, and don't ask me why we got pop before bread time, I have no idea. I don't understand that. We wouldn't have pop all day long, but we'd have pop before bread time. Okay. But yeah, a 16 ounce bottle, and we'd all get the same amount. He, he'd stack the glasses on the counter, and he was in charge of pouring to make sure everybody you knows there was no problem. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Let's see where am I? I'm gonna get sidetracked in my head, my notes here. <laughs> sometimes, and of course, uh, not very often. Maybe sometimes, uh, I say uh, this might happen more than the rest of us, because as my brother and sister would say, you know, I'm, I'm the spoiled one. Uh, I, you know, many amens back here. <laughs> but uh, my mom liked to say, oh, just wait till your dad gets home. <laughs> mom probably knows that I'm going to tell her today that I was okay, Mom. We didn't mind dad coming home because he would sit down with us. We'd still be in trouble. And I'm not saying that, that mom was a mean woman. Don't, don't misunderstand that <laughs> at all. Okay. But dad was a calm, cool, okay, what happened? We're going to talk about it. And then that was that. So when mom said, wait till dad, okay. <laughs> <laughs> said there, I remember spending some years, a lot of years, with these gateway singers at the state fair. They'd sing every hour on the hour, and I don't know, we'd start at, I remember, day, 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, we'd sing till, till dark, whatever, you know, and we'd spend hours, countless hours at the state fair. Well, one year, we borrowed a van and a trailer, a little pop-up camper trailer, and we'd even make it out of the parking lot, and that thing fell off the hitch. <laughs> and to this day, I was thinking, oh, you know, first of all, we don't go camping. I mean, because if, if we're going camping, we're going to a camp. That's how we camp. So we didn't know anything about a trailer, for one. And we lose this trailer, and I'm thinking, and I say, I'm, I'm not going to make it. Oh, now, now what do we do? Dad always loved sports, a lot, of, a lot of different things, you know, that Dad enjoyed. And he always tried to take us to a Royals game at least once a year. He made a lot of trips to Kansas City. I remember one year in particular, he goofed. I'm going to guess he was going to Florida, but I, I don't remember for sure. So we went to the game, and after the game, we were traveling. And where he goofed, he let my mom drive. <laughs> and what happened is mom realized that we were going on the same road that we'd just been on. Well, dad had told her before we left, oh, Kansas City's on the way. This, we, we have to go to Kansas City. It's, it's, it's on the way. Yeah, she figured out pretty quick, Kansas City wasn't on the way. <laughs> but, but dad always took time out, you know, for us, for, for, for family, for trips. Um, Making sure that, you know, he always held uh, the family together um, in, in a lot of different ways. Um, of course, a lot of spiritual ways, but, but we always had our, what would you say, our relaxing, uh, enjoyable times together. Of course, Dad's love and compassion for people, so prevalent in our extended family, y'all might see here in these front rows. Um, a lot of people that came from many miles. Uh, we have around 50 people that uh, we meet with every Thanksgiving. We rent a campground there in, in Nebraska, in, in Lexington, and uh, we always have a great time. But Dad always took time, and all those 50 people, you, you'd watch him, and he'd, he'd try to make it around to each individual. You know, this person might want to tell him a story or tell him a joke. Do a, do a puppet show, or, you know, all, all kinds of things were going on. And some of the rest of us might get bored or, or whatever of watching what was going on, but Dad never left until that individual said, okay, I'm done. You know, waited to the end and, and touched many of those lives uh, for so many years. Of course, it's, it was really neat to... Uh, Watch Dad with his grandkids and great-grandkids. Sure, you remember he always had some pretty neat hair. Um, as a kid growing up, we, didn't, we never touched the hair. <laughs> oh, no, we didn't touch the hair. And you never took a drink <clears throat> out of his cup. But what I realized here after the grandkids showed up, oh, they can mess up the hair. 
Here, grab all half a drink. You know, give it to him and he would drink it. What just happened? Yeah. Yeah, it's just so that I mean it's just it just neat to see. Oh, oh yeah. And also, when it comes meal time, oh no, those grandkids are Oh, you don't want that? Oh, don't put it on your plate then. That's okay. You don't have to eat that. <laughs> really? <laughs> I don't know if any of you have uh, ever stumped Dad with a bottle question. I knew a lot of you here probably made phone calls to him, talked to him at camp, asked a lot of questions. But if you've ever stumped him, I'd have to congratulate you. <laughs> and man, he, he knew all the answers. He knew all the answers. It's amazing. Um, I'd like to say that it wasn't, it wasn't just Bible. So many different topics, well-rounded in a lot of You talk to him about sports, you talk to him about history, a lot of different things. Not so much on the mechanic side, because like I said, if it was duct tape with all that, we were good. And that's probably about what the mechanics stopped. He always had time, of course, for everyone. Every Saturday morning, Dad would go calling. Of course, we'd get up on Saturday mornings and, and, and do our housework. Um, horse windows was probably the number one project. Uh, we always kidded that... Uh, Every winter it got a little bit colder in the house because those windows just kept getting thinner and thinner and thinner. I'm not sure how many times you washed windows. I really couldn't tell you. But they were clean. <laughs> so we'd work around the house on, on Saturday mornings. Uh, then had to go calling. Whole community appreciated that. Uh, just no matter where they were what part of the community we're in. We went home Wednesday to a three big pots of food from an individual in town. Guess what? She owned the ball. But it's people like that that it didn't matter who was in the community, that had a love and a compassion for every person in that community. And they had that com com uh, compassion back. I have to tell a story, and she's probably here, but uh, there was a, a man that uh, was a teacher when I went to school, and uh, didn't go to church so much when I was in school, but then he decided he would, he would attend church, come down, sat on the front row, I think he cried the whole service, this is a story. Walked out of church, picked up dad, that's a, you know, that's a big guy. Picked him up, set him back down, and walked out. <laughs> of course, he became a Christian. Him and dad were pretty good friends. But their joke was, <laughs> he told dad, he says, you know what? He says, when I get to heaven and when you get to heaven, he says, there's going to be a slight problem. And dad's like, well, what's that? And he says, well, I'm going to be so far in the back, and you're going to be so far in the front by God, that I'm about to have binoculars to see you. <laughs> well, that individual's got a pair of binoculars <laughs> in, in his casket. But, I mean, it's it, it just it, fun, fun times you have with that. Um, people understand just, just the love and passion. Of course, we went to many rallies. We were sitting around the other day. We were trying to figure how many camps and rallies and how many states we lost track we have no idea um, I would be safe to say that I would somebody in every, all 50 states would would, would know that I, I think that's pretty safe um, we've seen a lot of people um, shared a lot of things but just just the overwhelming uh, compassion, the thoughts, the prayers. Uh, we keep, you know, I've, I've had a question a few times a day, you know, how, how are we going to pick up the pieces and, you know, I guess we don't really understand the prep time that, that Dad took for a lot of different things, for rallies, for camps, uh, setting up a schedule, calling different 
different individuals, getting a phone call the week before, hey, by the way, hey, I can't make it. You know, that thing, well, that's fine. Um, so many things that uh, he did. Uh, it's going to be a, a huge, huge void. Uh, we'll, do, we'll, we'll do it. Uh, Of course, going to all those rallies and, and, and camps, kind of like the brag, I guess, or something, but maybe I'm a little crazy just what you want to say, but he was still my, my favorite speaker every time I went somewhere. Um, he, uh, how he could talk, and uh, from the littlest kid to the, to the oldest person in the auditorium, you think, wow, how does, how does he keep everybody's attention? Because he told stories, Bible stories, like, not like it happened many years ago. It was happening today. And it just, it just came out, and it was just amazing how he did that. And you sit there and wonder, okay, I'm, I'm going to try that. Oof, it's, it's unbelievable how, how we can do that. Just make it so real, uh, I would say just... In, in this time, unbelievable. Um, what has been written on your, in your pamphlet, Second uh, Timothy chapter four, verse seven. I fought the good fight, finished the race, kept the faith. I wish you could have uh, seen his face when he made phone when he received phone calls. He lit up. No one people called him. Um, he kept saying, "You know, I'm I'm going to go see this person. I'm going to see that person," and he is. Uh, that was that was his hope. He, he knows he was ready. Uh, but, but to have that, that joy that you can see in, in his face when you say, hey, you're going to see so-and-so. Yeah, I am, you know. You try to get that, that smile the best he could, you know. It's just awesome. <clears throat> um, I think he, he uh, would end every conversation with the person that called him. He would try to whisper, I love you. And he truly did. He truly did. Um, he, he loved each and every one of us, all of us here, um, throughout, throughout the nation. Um, he, he truly, truly did. Of course, mom and dad were definitely a team. Uh, there was definitely two of them. And I, I, I can't even put into words how, uh, how grateful I am to have that uh, background, that, that upbringing I had as, as a child. Um, you wouldn't begin to understand. It's just, it was incredible. Um, un unbelievable. So with that, um, I love you, Dad. I love you. We'll see you later. Thank you, Steve. Church camp was very much a part of Jerry's life. As a matter of fact, if we were to ask for folks to raise their hands who had been to church camp with Jerry, who had served with Jerry, and had uh, experienced that, you know, it was the most wonderful, wonderful time. Matter of fact, the very first time I ever met Jerry Weller, I was nine years old, and he was 16 years old, in a church camp in Gearing, Nebraska. That's where Jerry met Marilyn. Now, they did a lot of dishes together. They ended up on the same tribe. They somehow got together. And they did a lot of dishes because they had a rule at camp that you weren't supposed to be holding hands and making out and stuff like that. 
But I don't know what was happening underneath that dishwater. I don't know what was happening. It must have worked out. It worked out. I don't know. So here's some songs Jerry would have loved and sung. When the road is called up yonder, I'll be walking down the King's Highway. several camps that are such an important in all of our lives and uh, we so appreciate him the effort and the, the, the time and the, the, the problems that he had to solve and that kind of thing uh, and one of Dewey's favorite songs that just kind of came through Jerry and this continued on let's be true to Jesus singers we had the wonderful opportunity to do many 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 funerals with Jerry he did the most wonderful job of encouraging and blessing and, and helping grieving families uh, so, so much so fantastic and um, just some of now the toughest thing I think about grieving is is that our relationship with Jerry is frozen in time you know, we're not going to be having, hearing more of his good jokes. We're not going to be able to laugh at him. We're not going to be able to see his light shine in such a wonderful way in his community. We're not going to be able to do that. And um, so it's kind of frozen in time. But we do have memories. And so I think we will best be able to grieve and to love him by choosing what to remember. Take is going to come. Grandson Tate is going to come and help us to grieve in that way. Good afternoon. Um, over the past few days, uh, people young and old, near and far, have sent in tributes and memories of Grandpa. Maybe to share some of those with you today. 
I'm not sure where to begin. Jerry and I had several good years in managing the camp. We would choose camp classes, discuss how we would teach it, and then we would choose a teacher. It would often take us several hours to finish choosing the curriculum. I guess it was because we both enjoyed our special time together. When camp started, there were many nights trying to repair the well. Several years were dependent on a filter system for us to have water, even in bathrooms. The sewer system would get plugged once a day, and we'd have to dig it out. Jerry would last about an hour, and then he'd look up, and he was gone. <laughs> he always claimed he didn't have much mechanical ability. <laughs> We'd have some great volleyball games with students, the faculty usually won. Was it because we had a better team? Bill Payne and I would watch Jerry, and we would say, watch out. Jerry had his cheeks puffed out, and we knew the young people would be in for a hard swing. <laughs> then we'd be at Jerry's biggest cheerleaders. Some of my fondest memories were honoring of the seniors. The ladies always had a great program plan. One time, Jerry was the matador, and I was the bull. I found a broken handle pitchfork and was using that as the horns of the bull. I was chasing Jerry around and had no problem keeping out of the way. Afterwards, he said he never ran so hard in his life. <laughs> and we had a great laugh. Jerry, your great messages and an unusual sense of humor will be greatly missed. Thanks for being a friend. George Collins. Today, Jerry's body is laid to rest. Truly a bittersweet day knowing he is free from any discomfort or pain, but missing him here on earth. Over the past week, there have been so many posts on Facebook and memories and tributes to Jerry and his faith. It's been comforting and inspiring to read them. Like so many others, Jerry had such a great influence on my life. So many childhood memories are time spent with Jerry, Marilyn, and their kids, Tim, Mike, and Steve. Hanging at their house for piano lessons or when their parents went out, going to places in the green station wagon and waiting in the big brown van. Helping and having fun at the Cinderella rallies and February gatherings. Traveling to camps, youth rallies, and with and with him to some in Nebraska sometimes and getting to see his niece and my dear friend Kersey and her family. Remembering one of those trips always brings a chuckle. We were riding in the car and Marilyn was talking to Jerry and several others. He either didn't respond or didn't respond in context with the conversation. At some point Marilyn made a comment on his selective limited hearing and he responded that he was having a bit of trouble because, quote, the wind was whistling in his ear. <laughs> to which we all laughed. <laughs> It must have been after a stop, but he ended up on the side of the car that he was on, and we got going down the road, and the door wasn't quite tight, and wouldn't you know, the wind was indeed whistling by his ear. <laughs> There's so many other stories I can tell of Jerry's humor and ability to see the positives and fun side of life, but I'm so incredibly grateful for is the love of Christ he shared with me. Church has always been a great part of my life. There's never a question if we would go. If service was being held, my parents made sure we were there. What made the difference of wanting versus having to go was Jerry's incredible gift of being able to make any sermon relatable to both young and old and everyone in between. Through his teaching, I learned about the love of our Father. I learned about faith and trust in Him and Sunday and, and, and about forgivenesses when he when we'd ever, inevitably fail at times. From camps in Iowa and Kozad to youth rallies and Sunday and Wednesday services, Jerry helped me see and feel God's love and experience. And spirits the joy in, in, of accepting him and being baptized by Jerry in the camp over the age of 12. Although my walk hasn't always been easy, my journey still continues. And oh, what a joy has been able to see my kids choose God and attend the same camp I did each summer, hearing Jerry bring the Bible to life and foster their faith. Jerry, I love you and thank you so much for this foundation of faith. You, along with my parents, laid for me and your influence on my kiddos. Your walk on earth has ended, but your influence will live on for generations. I have no doubt you're hearing the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Till we meet again, Jan G. Evans. <clears throat> Every once in a while, someone intersects your life and makes a lasting difference in your story. And in my life, Jerry was such a person. As a child growing up, it seemed he was always around at the church functions. And when my dad and mom dropped me off at summer camp for the first time, I reasoned that it was going to be okay because Brother Weller was there. Over the years, I came to appreciate many things about Jerry, most specifically about his character. He was a tre tremendously talented orator with a natural, nat natural baritone voice that I've always envied. But far more important than that natural talent was his ability to, to take a biblical patch, passage and preach it with such clarity and conviction that it would move both young and old alike. I've never met a better Bible storyteller in these encounters with Jesus or forgotten Old Testaments or passages took on flesh. 
and spirit when he shared them. As a kid, I could see myself there, and I could say how much this has shaped my understanding and appreciation of scripture to this day. Probably those things that I appreciate most, however, were not as obvious. He was a humble man. Uh, uh, he was a humble man. Many people of his town intellect would have allowed these gifts to change him, but he never did. I remember one night after he preached at a rally, he helped me fix the broken toilet in the men's room. I discovered there weren't so many, there weren't too many servant leaders like him in this world. He loved people, really loved people. And it was obvious in many ways. The way he always had time for children, invested in the times and ministries of so many young men and women through Bible camps and all his years of teaching at MSC. The way he could take the word of God, correct us with it, but not condemn, even when the condemnation may have been in. I personally appreciate the way he loved and served my grandparents on both sides of my family. He would stop and visit my mom. He would stop and visit my mom's parents, even though they, had our, they hadn't been in church in years. My grandpa liked Brother Robert and he didn't like many preachers. <laughs> they knew he was generally concerned about them, both in this life and eternity as well. The way he served over 50 years in one church, in one community, becoming a preacher for the whole region around them, and so many more. Brother Jerry's homecoming has affected me more deeply than I would have expected. I think it is because he is one of the last in the era of men who accepted God's call to boldly build the kingdom and push back for darkness at a time. I know Brother Weller enough to know that he would remind us how now it's our turn to pick up that mantle, to share and protect the gospel of Christ Jesus in a time and with the talents God has given us. Today we mourn his passing because we've lost a great leader, husband, father, grandfather, sibling, and friend. But it's without question, Jerry's life mission will continue in the lives and hearts of so many who are led, taught, mentored, and loved by him. Jason Porter. Jerry Weller was a mentor to me when I enrolled in Midwestern School of Evangelism in 1973. His classes and assignments forced me to study. His preaching ability was the model of innovation and application. His own abilities as a preacher made his home life's classes challenging and drove home to me, and I know many others, how important preaching can be a God's, God's plan for the church. No one can doubt he believed the importance of camps and reaching out to youth. I saw this firsthand at Show Me Own Camp in Edderville, Missouri, and of course Sharon Wolf Camp here in Iowa through the years. This consistent example as a camp manager inspired me when I managed a camp. I always look forward to having him speak at our rallies and throughout the years. God often uses his message to challenge me in my thinking. His years of a dedicated servant to the church in Orleans has been an example for me and steadfastness. His faithfulness to God's word no matter what, has inspired me um, to love the truth. His willingness to work as hard as anyone, whether it be at MSC buildings, camp properties, or setting up rallies, or setting up rally, uh, rally time, he showed where his heart was at. I'm confident that that has continued, that his contribution to the kingdom of Christ here in Iowa and many places that he has so faithfully served will be best more than we realize now. May his life example inspire us be faithful. Amen. Dance with it. Our dear brother Weller has gone on to reserve his, reserve, receive his eternal crown from the King of Kings. The audience today can see, see his impact on so many lives that he has affected. In all the years of camp that I was with him as a teacher and preacher, Jerry stood out to me in the way he taught young children. He always had a way with children that would bring the life-saving message to our youngsters. Many grandparents and parents and children today can attest to this teaching done by Brother Weller because they were there. Through the planting of seeds in the kingdom, a multitude of these children are, are brothers and sisters in Christ and, and to our dear brother today. One day we all meet again with those people who have gone on before us. We can truly be thankful to this man and that he took this time to explain everything about the kingdom and his love for his Savior Jesus, Jesus Christ. A legacy, yes, an honor to watch him teach and preach. It's an honor to serve his kingdom with a resounding yes. Jack Lankford. <clears throat> My favorite thing about Grandpa is him telling stories to me, hugging him, and him telling me, ready, set, go, and racing around the car, and I hugged it, and he hugged the other side, and he told me he loved me. Samuel Pratt, age four. 
My favorite thing about Grandpa is when you run around, run around things or do things, some people look away, and you have to say, you weren't looking. I never had to say that to Grandpa. He always loved me to watch him play with me. I will miss him so much. Olivia Pratt, page seven. One of my favorite things that some people made sermons harder. <laughs> I'll try that again. One of my favorite things was that some people made sermons hard to understand. But when Jerry was preaching it, it was easy to follow and understand what was going right and what was going wrong. It was pretty simple to understand. I believe that things he taught to me will help me get to heaven one day. I miss climbing poles at the church and hearing them cheer for me. He was one of the most godly person I know. When I think of how to describe him, I think of the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That seems to be the best way to do it. Levi Pratt, age nine. Jerry paid attention to the small details, things most people wouldn't even care about. He remembered, and they were important to him, like climbing the poles of church or learning Bible verses. He was always a good example to me of how to be kind and respectful and a better person. He showed me how much your actions can affect others. I saw that even when my younger siblings would be constantly saying, Grandpa, 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 and talking a lot, and he still listened and was patient. He was the most patient person I know. It was important to him. He made everyone feel, feel special, and I want to be patient like he, he was too. I can see how important it is. Matthew Pratt, age 11. Jerry was so much fun to be around. He knew how to interact with everyone of all ages. Some people are around and act like they care or having fun, but Jerry really cared. I've always felt special to him. I never heard Jerry get angry or be scary. He was always able to calm things down. I am thankful for all the things he did with me and taught me, and I'll keep working to be more like him in my life. Isaac Pratt, age 13. I never remember, remember the time where I didn't know that Jerry cared for me. I always knew he was loved and special to him. He was the kind of person who made everyone feel special because to him, they really were. He was the greatest example of following after Jesus that I've ever seen in my lifetime. He's the most real person I know. If I try to think about what, what God would want us to look like in human form, it's Jerry. He always encouraged me to use my talents for God, like seeing and communicating. I hope he knows that I'm going to keep trying to use those talents for God. I'm trying to learn and pay attention to listen more like he did. To be attentive to others like he was for me. I know that even though he was gone, he is physically gone from my life, he will continue to live on in my life through my actions. I know that his goal for me was to see him in heaven, and I would never want to let him go. I feel like I had a best friend who was more than 60 years, old, 60 years older than I was. I will forever miss Ethan Brown, age 15. Jerry Weller was like a grandfather I never had. He was the best one you could ask for. He had such a loving outlook toward people, as I think back, I cannot remember ever hearing one negative thing that came out of his mouth about someone. He lived out of love of God and compassion of caring, so well in his life. I loved how he cared so much for about the things I was interested in, even if he knew nothing about them. He would take time to listen and learn those things, and those things became important to him. I love that there was always a safe space for, for everyone to share. In Sunday school, in Wednesday nights, BBS, at camp, he would spend hours with anyone who needed him. He could be a toddler wanting to ring the bell, or a teenager considering making a decision for God. I remember always rings being so happy when I could tell him verses and, and I, I memorized or seen him play, to play a song I learned. He made me want to rise up and, and be the good that he saw me. One of my favorite memories was my first year at camp. I was too young, but I was allowed a special permission to attend. Jerry and Marilyn let me stay with them in their camper. It was my first time sleeping away from home. I felt so special that year. I will never forget how real the Bible is. The stories he told since I was a little girl were so captivating in the way that they are, are still today. It seemed as if the things he were telling us happened in the backyard yesterday. I want to live with that kind of realness and unwavering faith in my life. Ariana Brown, age 16. How can you ask for a better family than this? Thank you, Grandpa, for everything you taught us, showed us, did for us, everything. He was one of my biggest role models, and I'm sure others can say the same. Stuff to say goodbye, but you rest easy knowing it's only goodbye for now. See you in heaven, Grandpa. That a lot. And I'll conclude um, with a note from Becky. It's titled, A Few Things I Learned From My Dad. 
Serving God is the most important thing I can do. From as young as I can remember, Dad taught us that God should be number one in my life, not only in words, but by his example. If there was a church activity or service, that's where we would be. I never felt like we had to go, but instead we get to go. Dad taught me that family is important. Even though Dad was busy in church, work, he always took time for, us for, 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 for his family. In his example of how he treated my mom, he taught me how important it is to treat your spouse with love and respect. Growing up, Dad made sure that Friday night was family. Being in Dad's family immediately extended, you knew that you were loved by him unconditionally. unconditionally. Dad taught me to love everyone. It has always amazed me how Dad loved and spent time with people. It didn't matter if you were young or old, rich or poor, where you lived, or even if you knew him, he would stop, listen, and talk to you. Dad taught me to never give up. Dad taught me to never give up on people. When Dad would go calling on people, he knew there would be some people who really didn't want to see him because he was a preacher. But he would go ahead and try to stop them and visit and try to become their friend. He had one guy who answered the door in his underwear trying to scare off Dad so he wouldn't come back and see him. It didn't work. <laughs> Dad was able to see the good, to see, his guy, to see this guy become a Christian and even became one of Dad's good friends. Dad taught me not to be selfish. Dad wanted as many people as possible to share heaven with him. His main concern that he expressed, was expressed to us in the last few months was making sure his family would share heaven with him. After being in the hospital for us, for, we were able to end. After being a, after the hospital let us in, and we were able to pin the last 26 hours with him, barely able to whisper over and over, we held the phone to his ear. He heard him whisper to those calling, I love you, see you in heaven. I'm thankful for Dad who unselfishly cared for so much for me that I can truly say it's no good, it's not goodbye, but I'll see you later. Thank you. Four years as a student and almost 55 years as an administrator uh, slash professor at Midwestern School of Evangelism. One of his star students, Tom Williamson, is going to sing one of Jerry's favorite songs. I'm sure I wasn't a star. Clouds will see Jesus rise to me. 
meet him in the air. Stepping on the clouds, he will greet us. All the good times we will share. I'm gonna leave this world behind me, going where the devil cannot find me. I'm going higher. Son-in-law Jeff has some thoughts he would like to share. begin with uh, a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 8 through 11 and this is probably right in the middle of a thought but I'm going to pull this out it says the man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose and each one will be a re rewarded according to his own labor for we are God's fellow workers you are God's field God's building by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful as how, how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Christ Jesus. Of course, that's Paul speaking, but I think the words could come from Jerry just as well. He did a lot of, of planting. I, I don't think he ever farmed. But I know several several years would come and, and he would want to plant a little garden. I don't know if the garden ever did a whole lot, but it, it intrigued him. And it was what he was doing um, in a, a more spiritual way, planting and watering. And of course he mentions the, the foundation. Now th this talks about the mechanical aptitude, which Steve mentioned it wasn't his strong suit. But I would add that it never stopped him. Um, if something needed fixed, he was going to fix it. And if you weren't going to fix it right, then he's going to fix it his way. And it'll hold together as long as the duct, as the duct tape lasts. So he would, he would go after it. And it mentions that no one can build on any other foundation than what is already there. And that is Christ Jesus. That's what Jerry built his life on. That's what his ministry was all about. And uh, he built, or he, he spent his time trying to develop that foundation in the lives of others. I don't know how many of you came for a short funeral. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. There's a lot of repetition here, but we're, we're sharing what we remember, the things we appreciated, and... Uh, I just call this Jerry Weller, my father-in-law and friend. I guess I'm the only one of the speakers that was chosen to be a part of the family. Um, <laughs> no, no benefit to that exactly to everybody else. But, but there was this girl that had a lot to do with that. And we'll leave that at that. But I, I think I can truly say that he was a friend. He, he was an encourager. And uh, someone asked me today if I was ready for this. And I said, I, I'll know when I'm done. Uh, but it seemed like I got into a lot of speaking situations because of my father-in-law. And he always said, you can do it. And you'll be just fine. And some, some, or some Saturday nights he would give me the outline for a sermon. <laughs> 
I'm sure that none of you other preachers probably wait till Saturday night. And <laughs> for some time in my, my preaching career, I was at the Weller's house on Saturday night. And I, I was preaching in Lynn, Missouri, which took most of the four hours down, down to, to get there. And I think he was working on something too. The only difference is it might have been next week's sermon instead of tomorrow's. And as I'll talk about in a little bit, he might change it before the time is over. When I get a sermon ready, I, I put the date on it and the place. And I don't think he probably needed to do that because it might change. I might not actually preach it there on that date. I might preach something else. Some have mentioned, and I, and I go along with that, he spent the majority of his life pursuing young people with the intent of influencing them for Christ. He was all about anything that would bring kids to a knowledge of their Savior. He was the driving force between or behind area youth rallies. One of the things I, I really enjoyed about this area when I first came those, those years ago was there are youth rallies here every month. Where I came from, we didn't have all that. And I thought, this is heaven? No, it's Iowa. <laughs> Sorry. But I, I thought that was amazing, and he was a, a part of that, the driving force, I believe, because he organized it, and if somebody couldn't handle the youth rally anymore, he'd find somebody that could. And so the youth rallies would go on, and I think that was a tremendous thing for the kids of our area. And you knew there was a serious reason that he wasn't at a youth rally. Now, he has been involved since... Summer camp, or in summer camps since I don't know when, some of you would know better, but when they needed management, he and his wife stepped in and camped at Miss B. Someone, someone asked me today, um, what do you want me to pray about? I'm worried about camps. Ever since I've been here, Jerry has managed, and he mentioned this this past spring that maybe the trustees should find a new camp manager. No, I said let's let's just let's get the people there, and we'll let you be armchair quarterback. And we'll see how it goes. Of course, everybody knows the story of this summer. And, uh, and now it's serious. We, we've got to find management for camp. That'll be a struggle. Jerry has taught many kids and their kids and probably, some, uh, probably several third generation campers. He influenced young people as they came through Bible college all those years as well. He guided and counseled any who needed an ear to listen to them. It's one of the things I, I was so impressed with when I came to Bible college. Sometimes a, a class will cause questions to come into your mind, and for some reason it seemed like Jerry didn't need to eat lunch because he would answer questions. And when the questions finally died out, I, I guess he ate. I don't know. Um, maybe that was his food, but it seemed like Jerry never said, you know, i got to go now. I, I've got to do something. It was always somebody else into the conversation. And there might be some, somebody waiting to ask more. But he was always a listening ear. I don't know if he ever backed away from a project he believed in. When it comes to camp, and, and this goes to all the repairs, uh, anything that happened at the church of Orleans or the school building, for repairs, he's going to do it. It's going to get done, and I'm not going to back down. He and his family came to Orleans, Iowa, when their children were, were small, there were two of them at the time. They took to the community as though it was God's mission for their lives. 
Countless people have felt their love and concern over the years. If you don't know Jerry Weller, you must be new to town. Because he knew everybody, and everybody seemed to know him. And so last, last winter, we were on our way to their house, and uh, it was icy. We probably shouldn't have been out. But along came, uh, we, we passed another lady who was off in the ditch. I guess she shouldn't have been out either. <laughs> but she was headed back to, or trying to get back to Unionville. And of course, I would say, do you know Jerry Weller? Yeah. And uh, everybody seems to know him. And so, his ability to enthrall the kids at the beginning of each day of daily vacation Bible school is still a vivid picture in our minds. If you never saw that, it seemed like all the things he would teach you, well, maybe not. I'm thinking the, the things that he taught you in homiletics to be uh, astute and uh, sober. No. He probably never taught that, did he? <laughs> but it was, it was just something that, to behold how he would connect with the kids the beginning of every day. He cherished the opportunity to spend time with kids, and it kept him young, way past ordinary years. The extent of his efforts will never be fully measured. Jerry and Marilyn love kids, and they have spent themselves to find, or to help kids find the Lord. Preaching. I guess you're going to hear a lot of preaching. You saw a lot of pictures of, of Jerry preaching, and I, I think that was his passion from a very young age. He was spellbound by preachers who came to visit where he was as a child. He was impressionable, and he caught the fever. It's hard to imagine that Jerry could do anything else but preach. His passion brought him to Midwestern School of Evangelism, and I think he must have fit like a hand in a glove. His abilities in teaching brought him back after graduation to be at the front of the classroom, and his talents were well recognized by students for nearly 50 years. And if there were any more than that, they just failed to recognize him. That's a joke, sorry. <laughs> bad. It seems in my mind that homiletics was his best class. The Art of Sermon Delivery. Although he wrote the book on Preach the Word, he was best at oratory. And he made stories come to life, as we've already known, and if you ever heard him, you knew. It was easy to be sort of intimidated by his ability to hold an audience's attention as he put his points into their minds. And so sometimes you didn't want to follow Jerry on, on the program. If, if he was preaching first, you'd like to just wait till sometime later. <laughs> try to try to match that. I have no idea the number of sermons that he preached, the rallies he preached on, the classes he taught, the flagpole camps, or the, the flagpole talks at camp. But I, every time I, I think of that, I think that that was something that. I know he studied for it, I know he prepared for it, but it seemed like that wasn't a part of the program at camp. But to me, that was one of the most valuable times of, of camp, because he would always talk about patriotism and people who did great things for our country. And it seems that he wrote history books or something, because he seemed to know everything that happened in our history. And I think he had a passion for people to love our country. We sure could use a more, more of that. So I don't know how many of those he did, but I do know the reason why he was a constant at the Labor Day rally at St. Joe, the Spring rally at Hastings, the Vintage rally in Ludlow Falls, as well as the February gathering in the Centerville rally here in Iowa. May all those he taught and influenced be encouraged to carry his passion for God's word and dedication to rightly dividing it continue that legacy. The Church of Orleans has appreciated his preaching for 50 plus years. They have given opportunity for many to experience his wisdom, concern, love, and faithfulness. God fashioned the Church of Orleans to be the environment where Jerry could radiate the message of God's love and forgiveness. 
And then there was music. Jerry loved music. And I don't know this for a fact, but the stories I've heard, this is how I've translated as a youngster. He was a bit frustrated with singing. He was attempting to sing a melody where it was written and not doing so great at it, struggling. And then someone introduced him to the other end of the piano. And a new world was born in his ability to sing bass. He had a very strong voice, as you know. It's kind of like it was made for preaching and, and singing. And his voice was easily distinguished among other voices. He always encouraged others to sing, whether a solo, duet, quartet. I, I don't know, but I'm thinking maybe quartet was his favorite place. Or larger groups. Uh, last February Gathering Choir, uh, we knew that he had cancer. Never thought it would be the last choir he would, would direct, but he was an ever present person at Area Sinspirations. You know, you type the word Sinspiration into your computer and it doesn't want to accept it. But we still do Sinspirations. We still enjoy them. And, and he really enjoyed those. He kept the weekly special music going at the church in Orleans, uh, always on the schedule. I think Jerry was always listening to gospel music, whether it was audible to the rest of us or not. I'll never forget when uh, this was something that happened at school. Brother Hunt, I think, was teaching the class, and he was trying to make a point to his students that when you're studying, you shouldn't have any distractions. Now, today we have those headphones you put on and nothing can be heard. But he was trying to get, get all the distractions out of the way, and so he, he made a spiel for this, uh, a sales pitch, if you will, and then he kind of motioned to Jerry to enforce that, or not enforce it, but to second the notion that that's the way it should be. And by that time, Jerry was my father-in-law, and I'd been studying Saturday nights at his house. And I knew it wasn't quiet. I could always hear music coming up the, the basement stairs or, or into the living room through the basement floor or the, the floors. And so I thought that was interesting because he was always down there studying, focused, I'm sure. So anyway, I was curious as to his response, and I, I wasn't surprised. He, he just couldn't quite exactly agree with Brother Hunt on that, that point. Sometimes you need a little bit of music to distract you. And so if you're, if you're at my house while I'm studying, you might find out I've, I learned something from him. And there's probably music going. Music is too valuable an extension of God's message to man to not pursue and enjoy it. You might have thought, and I think it was mentioned, that uh, Jerry loved Southern Gospel music. He did, but that wasn't all he enjoyed. He enjoyed a, a wide variety of music, and every once in a while he would surprise you. A few years ago, there was a, a contemporary artist, well, okay, at least contemporary for me, uh, he's still singing, still drawing a pretty good crowd. And we thought about going, and we did go. And Jerry said, yeah, I know Michael W. Smith. And I think probably some people his age would say, who? Michael W. what? Must be Dan's brother. <laughs> but he knew, because he, he dabbled in other music, just because it's music. I can't tell this story, but uh, one time there was a quartet that was singing, and we were singing a song, and we had to stop. We, we, we just couldn't keep going. Uh, I think the, the quartet was up there er, earlier, and Mike Blackledge, some of you would remember, was sitting somewhere close to the front row, and I think this was at the Centerville Rally. And Jerry was supposed to sing a part that said something about a four-part sound. But it didn't come out that way. 
Apparently you've heard it. Some of you have. Well, anyway, I I don't I think maybe I was supposed to come in kind of an echo thing, and that didn't work. Uh, and poor Mike Blackledge was just rolling, and nobody else could sing, so I'm not sure how the song ended. But I guess all that to say that if Jerry couldn't see the words, he would make up his own. <laughs> and he did that several times. <clears throat> one of the last things, I'm not done yet, but one of the last things I want to talk about is involvement. And I think I can safely say that I don't know anyone else Jerry's age that is as involved in so many different things. And I'm still using present tense. Because he still, still has an influence. And so, I know some have talked about this, but I just, this is amazing to me to think about what he did. And I don't know all of it, but here are a few things. Preaching every Sunday morning, teaching a class every Sunday morning, preaching again every Sunday evening, and, in you know, addition to all that, being ready to step in when needed for leading songs or doing a communion talk, leading the service each Wednesday evening, teaching the adult class, Daily Vacation Bible School, three weeks of camp at Sharon Bluff, one week of camp in Nebraska, leading and planning the Centerville Rally and the February Gathering, promoting, scheduling, and attending area youth rallies, and doing the same with area inspirations, editing, printing, and mailing the Voice of Evangelism for the last several years, as well as preaching for area funerals and weddings. I think you can get, kind of get an idea how busy he was. It takes people to make things happen. He just felt the need to get involved, so he did. Laughter was a big part of who he was, and he enjoyed it often with many others who needed its value. And some of us even kind of thought this morning, or this afternoon, or whatever time it is, that uh, that's probably what's happening up there now with, with some of those jokesters that he used to hang out with. understand some things about Jerry. He had abilities that no one else has. He had a mind that was full to overflowing and yet continued to thirst for more. He could preach a sermon without any prior notice or develop a new one on his way to the pulpit or give you an outline on the spot. I'll never forget one year at camp. Um, we had a guy that I guess maybe wasn't too used to teaching or preaching at camp, and so the time came for his sermon, and he told Jerry, I, I don't think I'm ready. I just can't do it. And Jerry thought, well, no problem. I'll just, I'll preach my sermon now, and we'll just go on, and then when my time comes up, then he can have it. And so that worked pretty well until it was Jerry's scheduled time to preach. And once again, the guy said, I'm just not ready. I just can't do it. And so Jerry preached his sermon for him. I can't do that. And so I don't know that he understood how intimidating that was for the rest of us, for him to be able to do that. But it's amazing. God gave him such a mind to do that. One of our men's retreats um, recently, one of the men after, after one of Jerry's classes said, you know, we've got to keep him teaching. We've got to hear more from him. He has a, a, a basket that just never seems to empty. His insight and wisdom was powerful. And yet he was so humble, always wanted others to have the first chance. So... There's some empty shoes. It's going to take a lot to fill them. Jerry Weller couldn't have had a better father in law. But 
But I've got to end with this challenge. Jerry's message for you today is this. God's love is ever present. God will always love us. God's forgiveness, however, is only available for a short time. Your lifetime. God's invitation is loud and clear. So what are you waiting for? Let him who gave you life give you eternal life as well. Thank you, Jeff. The family's requested that we sing a couple of songs that were favorites of Jerry's. And so if you'd like to stand up on this next song, feel free to do that if you can. Would you stand with us as we sing, This World Is Not My Home, I'm Just A Passing Through. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up. singers have had the honor and we thank the family so very much for allowing us to be a part of this magnificent service we uh, love you and and we are we will all be praying for you and and encouraging you in every way possible 
Thank you for sharing Jerry's life with us. The last few, Jerry did such a fantastic job of encouraging people during funerals. And, and there was a song that we always sang um, when we did that with Jerry. And, and, and we'd like to sing that now. I'll bet the trumpets play and the angels sing every sweet refrain of amazing grace and that heaven's hands opened up the gate and the children danced when they saw your face as happy as they were to see you coming i was just as sad to have to watch you go oh but knowing what i know about heaven believing that you're all the way You're somewhere better is all I need to let you go. I would hope that I could pray you back, but why on earth would I do that? When you're somewhere, love and life never ends. Oh, but knowing what I know about Every single voice makes a joyful noise. How sweet the sound when the saints rejoice. To every broken heart, every wounded soul, new life begins on the streets of gold. Where every tear is raining here from my eyes, I know the sun is shining where you are. somewhere better is all I need to let you go I would hope that I could pray you back but why on earth would I do that when you're somewhere love and life never ends oh but knowing what I know about Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Kingdom come, that will be done on earth. Thank you for sending your servant, Jerry, who has exemplified a simple yet powerful and elegant design for our lives that you presented to him and he shared it with us. Thank you for his witness. Thank you for his family. Thank you for the way they have chosen through his influences and yours, obviously, to follow you in every way. Thank you for the fun we've had. Thank you for the faith we've enjoyed. Thank you for the family. We come today to recognize that we no longer will be able to enjoy Jerry's jokes or, or sing with him or laugh with him or, or listen to his, his speaking your word. But would you please grant us some memories that we can enjoy and that we can experience and we can apply to our lives. It is in your name that we pray a blessing on this family as they grieve and as they go into the future, sending a message into the future to people who never ever knew Jerry of your love and your mercy. Would you? lead through them, would you bless them, would you encourage them in every single way, as we do today. In Christ's name, we pray, amen. At Sunset View Cemetery, there will be a burial service following this service.
And we want to thank, the family wants to thank each and every one of you for your presence here, and you are welcome to that graveside service. May the Lord bless you. Have a good day. Thank you.